Okay, so um, today we'll continue to uh, we'll continue learn the topic of optimization, and uh, um, so let's recall. This is panel number one, and uh, um, so let's recall review. We have tested um, the gradient descent method last Friday um, to solve this problem. That is, we want to find uh, the minimum of a function. So this omega can be either um, like the all the domain or the R in space, or it can be a subset. Uh, n. Um, so we've learned we've learned uh, for the local minimizer all right the necessary condition is so I'll directly write down the result it's a gradient at this point has to be equal to the zero vector all right So this is uh, this is a uh, last time we proved last week we proved this has to be true. All right, we kind of um, explain what we have learned in calculus, and then what we did is we use the gradient descent method, and it 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 is an iterative method. Uh, the next iterate. is the previous iterate subtract eta, eta is the step size, multiply with uh, the gradient at previous uh, iterate. And we have shown, we also have shown that um, the gradient is the direction that this function increases fastest. If we take a negative number. By the way, this eta is a positive number. So this vector is the function. So if the function decreases fastest. All right. However, however, we observed last Friday that eta cannot be too big. So we, we can't be too greedy. It's like, uh, we know that this direction, so this direction right here, this direction right here, this function decreases the fastest, but we cannot be too greedy. You know, if we take a very big eta, basically we'll get garbage result. Like um, it doesn't converge at all. We have to choose a small enough eta so that this thing converge. So that's our observation. All right, so um, that's our observation, which motivates us to ask the following questions. Okay. Um, we, we, we also observed that uh, initially, initially the gradient descent converges linearly, but after a while, so when we choose small enough eta, initially it converges linearly, but after a while, the convergence slows down to like sublinear. So we wanna explain why this is the case. And we have the following three questions to ask based on the observation last Friday. The first one is, uh, is say why eta needs to be small. The second question, even though uh, I hadn't explained uh, using an example back in Friday, but the second question is actually pretty relevant. The second question that's the following. This algorithm, the gradient descent algorithm, somehow, somehow it converges to, um, so let me write down here. 
if it is converging, okay? It converges to a point such that gradient is zero. So it converges to a point, the gradient is zero, but gradient is zero doesn't necessarily mean uh, it's a local minimum, okay? So um, how do we know? So how do we know this point is a local minimizer? This is the second question we would like to ask. Okay. So the third question we would like to ask is uh, uh, why how the uh, gradient descent? So converges linearly um, in the initial, maybe say uh, 50 iterations or 100 iterations uh, initially, then, then uh, slows down. And uh, these are the three questions we would like to ask um, in this week and the next week. Um, so let me add one more uh, line here. So why we need to choose eta small and how to choose eta. Okay. So these are the three questions we would like to answer um, in the subsequent lecture, but these are the motivating questions based on the observation. So intuitively, we use this algorithm to, uh, to get down to our local minimizer, but uh, we observed that there are some caveats, so uh, we need to uh, address those things. So today, let's... Uh, uh, Today, let's try to address question number two. And uh, on Wednesday, we'll try to address question number three. Okay. So question number two, uh, we actually, we have an answer. Um, theorem two, I'm sorry, uh, theorem three actually. So last time we had two theorems, sorry. Um, the, on Wednesday, we had two theorems. So this is theorem three. And it says the following, it says the following. So if, uh, so F is smooth, so is at least a twice differentiable, it's a uh, second derivative is, um, is continuous. Okay. And, uh, um, and X star is a local minimizer. Let me check if the remote student can see the edge of the board. Okay, so a little bit on top, there is a little bit of cutoff. Um, let me increase the brightness. Okay. Um, then, last time we proved the gradient must be zero. must be zero vector. This is the last Wednesday we have proved that. Uh, um, so it's like uh, we prove what our calculus class tells us to do. Okay, so in calculus, we didn't prove that, but uh, uh, now we prove this. And we actually, similar to the calculus class, the calculus class says double prime is greater than zero, which means it's convex. It's a local minimum. We have something similar here. And the Hessian, and the Hessian, okay. And the Hessian matrix, this is a matrix. This matrix is greater than or equal to zero. So let's recall what does a matrix greater than equal uh, to zero mean. So recall, 
uh, a matrix. So this is, uh, this is the end of the theorem. If it's a local minimizer, then these two conditions are true. So let's recall what a matrix is greater than or equal to zero means. So we say, um, we say a matrix, so let me, let me say this, A is M by M matrix, and A is greater than zero, uh, greater than or equal to zero, it means uh, for any vector, so for any vector, um, let me use a new panel. So let me use a new panel. Um, so for matrix A, and this matrix is in, uh, is an M by N matrix. Okay. And normally we restrict ourselves in the symmetric regime. So uh, everything we talk about the matrix are by M by N symmetric. We normally, we have this restriction because uh, we want our eigenvalue to be real numbers. Otherwise we cannot talk greater than or equal to zero or less than or equal to zero. So A is greater than um, or equal to zero. It means it's the same as for any, so for any We can think uh, for any uh, x vector that's in uh, R and, and x, so non-zero, non-zero vector. Um, x transpose a x is greater than or equal to zero. This is a number, all right? This is a matrix and this is a real number. So um, we can think this is a, uh, um, X is an N by one vector, okay? And uh, A is an M by M matrix and X transpose is one by M vector. So one by M vector multiply with N by M matrix, we get a one by N. So these two got canceled. So we get a one by M vector and then one by M vector times N by one vector, these two got canceled, we get a one by one vector which is a scalar. So this scalar is greater than zero and uh, uh, it means this matrix is greater than or zero. Now we, so we wanna prove this. And so I, I'll tell you, you guys, uh, we would like to prove this using contradiction, which means we need to find the contraposition of this matrix being greater than or equal to zero. So now the contraposition Contraposi contraposition means uh, lo uh, logically, um, logically, um, we take the negation of this statement. So what does a matrix is less than zero means? It means, so we take the logic negation of this. This is for any X in this Rn. If we take negation, it becomes there exist. So there exists a vector X. Let's, let's use Y, okay? So there exists a vector Y such that, and we take negation of this statement, which means Y transpose a Y is less than zero, okay? And we can restrict this Y is non-zero, but uh, it's not essential. So this is a contraposition and we would like to use, this is our first tool we would like to use. The second tool we would like to use traces back to um, a function we learned last time. So this is the first tool 
we would like to use is use a control position to prove the theorem by contradiction. The second tool we would like to use is we recall the Taylor expansion. Last time we defined a function um, on Wednesday, actually, not last time, last time we did some coding. On Wednesday, we define the following function with g of t as follow. It's f of uh, um, x plus t times a direction. So let me use, uh, let me keep consistent with the textbook. Let me use a p as a direction. So think about this. It's something like, it's something like if this is x and this is our vector p, so x plus p, we get here, it's x plus p, all right? And t is some function, maybe say from zero to one. When t is zero, we're here, okay? So we're here, what, when g of z, uh, when, when, if we evaluate g of zero, it's just a f's value at this point. So um, it's like g of zero, what at here. And if we take, if we take t equals one, it's g of one. It's like g of one is here. And when t changes from zero to one, it's like we're just taking a sneak, taking a snapshot of the function along this line. It's like, a, for example, if t equals a half, we're looking at uh, the function's value at this uh, midpoint of this line, joining these two points. So we define this function g so that it's easier to take derivative of. For example, all right. So first of all, we know that f is smooth. It means g is smooth because uh, there is no sing singularity. This is a just linear function of t. So um, nothing fancy, but by mean value theorem, by mean value theorem, we have something like this. This is by mean value theorem, we have a g of t subtract g of zero. Um, is g prime of c times t minus zero. So this is by mean value theorem. And now let's compute what is a g prime of c. So um, this means, so we look at the left, it is f of x plus uh, t times this vector, subtract, uh, subtract f of x, if we take g prime and uh, g prime of c means uh, we take the derivative and then we let uh, t equals c. okay. So using chain rule, using chain rule, we have the following. Um, so let me, uh, let me write down the chain rule right here. So it is, uh, Okay, let me directly do it here. So it's gradient of f evaluated at x plus um, c times p. And then chain rule, the second rule, uh, the second term of the chain rule is we take a derivative, we take derivative with respect to this t, and then we evaluate at t equals c. But after we take derivative of this uh, uh, t, is, this is d d t of uh, x plus, uh, plus t times p, evaluated at t equals c. When we, after we take the derivative, it's a constant. So this evaluation doesn't really matter. And then we multiply this t. So let me write down, um, let me check if the remote student has any questions.
Um, so now let's write down the formula we have derived. So this formula is a first order Taylor expansion of a multivariable function. Okay, so let's check if uh, it's visible to the remote student. Okay, it's kind of visible. Um, now, because we, we would like to uh, consider the Hessian, right? So we want to consider the second derivative as well. So let's do a, um, this is mean value theorem. And for the second derivative, we have something as follows. So which is G of T uh, equals, so this is, this is a Taylor theorem. Okay. Um, G of zero plus G prime of zero times uh, T subtract zero plus g double prime of cos c divided by two and the t subtract of zero, we take square, okay. So this is a, this is a Taylor expansion, second order in calculus, but our g, keep this in mind, our g is always keep this in mind. Okay, our g is this guy. So now let's, uh, let's replace every term of G by its F counterpart. So the left is F of X plus uh, T times this direction vector P. And G of zero is just uh, the point, which is F of X. Okay. So G, prime of zero, let me, let me remind, let me remind us, okay, this is G prime of cos C. Or say this term is G prime of cos C. So, uh, without this T, Okay, it's T times G of C. So this dot product is this G prime of C. Now it's G prime of zero is we just let this C to be zero. Okay, so what happens here is a plus. So T subtracts zero, we get T. So this is T P vector and C is zero. This is dot product of gradient of F, okay. Next is we have to compute this term. Uh, this should be panel number, I think this should be panel number five. This should be panel number six. Okay, and uh, um, that that's our G of Cassi. That's uh, um, G prime of Cassi is gradient of F um, X plus Cassi P dot product with this vector P. This, this is our G prime of Cassi. And now we're gonna take another derivative 
of this function, but with respect to Cassi, keep this in mind. Cassi is some, uh, some scalar function right here, okay? So prime. If we take derivative, this is actually a not so easy um, because it's a dot product. What we want to do is we write down explicitly what the stock product is about. This is gradient. Gradient is nothing but a partial derivatives. And the dot product is we adding every like a component product together. So it's i equals one to n partial f partial xi evaluated at x plus cp vector dot dot with I mean, this is not dot product, but I just want to emphasize we have a product here. Uh, times the uh, ith component, ith component of p. Okay. So we have that. Now what we're going to do is we take partial derivative of this guy. Okay. So this is uh, this is the uh, the second derivative the difficult part of the second derivative is for every term, for every term, there is a, a dot product. So that's a difficult part because we can treat, actually we can treat this function as another function for every like i. So we, we have, we have like a, so we have something like times p1 plus something times p2, plus dot, dot, dot. And actually, when we take another derivative, p are constants. Okay, so we don't worry about p too much. But for every of these partial derivative, we have to use a chain rule. So let, let, let's use a chain rule. So if we use a chain rule, what we find here is for every of these function, we have to take gradient. So we have to take gradient of partial, partial xi. Then we evaluate at. Okay, let, let me uh, let me don't use a bracket. Let me use uh, so let me use uh, the evaluate at notation. So we take gradient of each partial derivative and this partial derivative, this gradient is evaluated at x plus c p, okay? So this is the first layer and because we take derivative of this one, so this is like the outer derivative, the inner derivative is still, we take derivative of this function with respect to c. So we'll get another p which is, dot with p, okay? And this is a partial, I mean, this is a derivative of this function and then we multiply another pi. Okay. So this is panel number seven. The next is we just uh, expand this, this dot product. This is a dot product. So I wanna emphasize this is a dot product. Um, so this dot here is a dot product. And now we write down explicitly what this dot product is about. The dot product is nothing but uh, we multiply two numbers, then we're summing up every component. Um, 
So it's the same thing here. The gradient, first of all, the gradient is, by the way, uh, when, we, when we use, when we use uh, um, expansion for the inner, inner product, the start product, uh, when we take the gradient, we have to change to another script, subscript J instead of I. Okay, so we want to tell the difference between these two. So it's J from one to N and the partial, partial XJ of partial F, partial X. So this is a gradient. This is a gradient of a partial F of XI. We, we can use like a two XIs otherwise. Um, it will be confusing. And this guy evaluated at x plus cp and multiply uh, the jth component. This is the jth component of, uh, um, of p and then times pi. Okay. As we can see, this is the second derivative, okay? This is the second derivative. And uh, uh, if we rewrite, this is panel number eight, by the way. So now if we simplify this, we simplify, we just uh, um, simplify the notation and uh, we rearrange the term because uh, if we multiply a pj and then this sum, is multiplied by a pi, it means every term is multiplied by a pi. And what we can do is, this is i from one to n, and this is j from one to n. And the inner, the inner is we take derivative of xi first, then xj second, it's actually the second derivative of, of f. And evaluate at this point. So now let me use uh, the parentheses to denote the variable of this one. Okay. And then it's multiply pj, multiply with pi. So this guy multiply with pj and multiply with pi. And before we write down the final expression, so let's review or say, let's learn the following expression. So a, a symmetric matrix, so a, a symmetric matrix uh, and a equals a i j m by n. This means um, the i j entry is just a little i j. Then x transpose a x is nothing but, so this is a formula we can memorize. And if this will be tested in the final exam, if we have an online final exam, this formula will be given as well. Um, it's nothing but xj aij times x. Same thing here. Okay, this is like our AIJ. So this is the quadratic form. And this is uh, the term for the Taylor expansion. So it is, uh, um, it is equal to P transpose times the Hessian 
evaluated at x plus cp times p. So p transpose a p. This is a this is a final formula for the second derivative. And now we can finally answer this question. We can write down what's happening here. Okay. So let's replace this question mark with what we have just derived. So this term becomes, so t squared divided by two and times p transpose, the Hessian matrix times p vector. So this is a formula. This is a formula. Also in the homework, we have to use this formula. Okay. So uh, in the homework, we may, we may have to rederive this formula. I mean, follow this uh, routine. Okay. But, uh, uh, but in general, we will get something very similar. But in the homework, we have to rederive it. Okay. Uh, because uh, we're looking at a different expression. But the idea is the same. We introduce a function, we introduce a G that uh, looks like that. And then we take first derivative, then we take the second derivative. And, uh, but uh, this is a formula. Okay. This is a Taylor expansion of the second order. And we'll use the tool, these two to prove the theorem. We just, uh, so let me ask uh, the remote students if they are good. Okay, thank you. Let me end the poll. Um, so this is panel number six, and this is panel number seven. This is panel number nine. So uh, let me, let me start and use a new panel here. So now um, to prove theorem number three, actually it's a five minute proof. So uh, to prove of, uh, of theorem, so the proof of theorem three is kind of straightforward. We, we assume, so if you look back at your notes, it is for any, for any, it's, it's like a, um, it's greater than or equal to zero. It means for any vector, we have, P transpose Hessian P is greater than or equal to zero. Now we assume otherwise. So we assume. So we assume otherwise, i.e., we assume there exist, there exists a P vector, a P vector such that P transpose the Hessian matrix. Okay. And this is X star, by the way. P transpose Hessian matrix X star P is less than zero. Okay. Keep this in mind. Keep this in mind. This is a function. It's a Hessian. Even though it's a Hessian, it's a matrix. But it it's still a function in this X variable. These two are like a vectors, constant vectors. So like coefficients, which means this function is continuous about this variable. And we, we know that F is C2, it means it's continuous with this variable, okay? So for a continuous function, it's less than zero, then we can find a neighborhood such that it's less than zero. So for continuous function, so for example, for continuous function, we have it's less than zero here, then we can find, so if this is X star, then we can find a neighborhood such that this continuous function is less than zero in that neighborhood. So because now, because, because F is smooth, 
you mean the second derivative is continuous, there exists a neighborhood So there exists a neighborhood of X such that, such that, so such that, P transpose Hessian. So such that P transpose Hessian P is less than zero for, for X in this neighborhood. This becomes the key. And now we just uh, um, copy paste our um, Taylor theorem here. Okay. So um, we, first of all, we let a T equals one. Okay. We let T equals one. So now we let uh, T equals one in this formula here and we choose Uh, let me think. So, um, oh, we, we can't let t equals one, sorry. We have to let, uh, we have to keep t here, okay? So we choose t small enough, my bad. So now we choose t small enough such that X plus T P, okay, is still is in this neighborhood as well. Okay. And now we use this formula. Okay, we just copy down this formula and uh, um, we'll see what happens. So we choose T small enough so that uh, our left side is still in this neighborhood, but let's look at the right side. Okay, let's look at the right side. And uh, we have to, ch we have to uh, change everything X to X star. So this is X star, this is X star, this is X star, and this is X star. X star is our local minimizer we have now. Now let's look at the right side. If X star is the local minimizer, it means this, this guy is zero. Okay. So T is small enough, but T is not zero. I mean, we can choose T to be positive, but it doesn't matter that much. So we choose T to be positive. And this could see here, this could see here is between zero to T. So we choose T to be positive. We, we choose T small enough, but uh, T is not zero. And this could see is between, is between zero and the T, okay? This could see is between zero and the T. This term is less than zero right here because within this neighborhood, within this neighborhood, we have this for any x. So this is this point is in this neighborhood as well, which means this term is less than zero. So now this is the key. We reached a contradiction. 
the second term is zero, the third term is less than zero because uh, this is a positive term. Okay, so t squared divided by two is a positive term. Then we have the third term is less than zero, which means the left side is strictly less than, is strictly less than our local minimizers function. So now we only have to take, let's say the local minimizer, you know, um, we just have to take the neighborhood is small enough so that the local minimizer is the smallest within this neighborhood. So now the last step is we just take So that's panel number 10, this is panel number 11. And now we just take, uh, um, the intersection of this neighborhood with the neighborhood in which now we just have to so this is just a formality but because we have actually already proved over there there is a contradiction this formality is we have to just take, okay, so because we have a local minimizer, we have to restrict our local minimizer in the neighborhood. And now we have shown that within that neighborhood, there exists a point that's with function value less than our local minimizer, we have a contradiction. So we have a contradiction. And we actually, we have proved the theorem. So, um, because uh, we assume that. So the initial assumption is wrong and we take the contraposition, the initial uh, assumption and which means the Hessian should be uh, positive. Okay. So now uh, let's summarize what we have learned today. Okay. So to summarize, it's a second order condition. We have learned the second order condition today. So um, it's uh, the Hessian has to be um, non-negative at our local minimizer. So equivalent description, equivalent description is, is saying, it's saying F So this is equivalent to saying F is convex near, um, uh, it's local minimizer. So this is an equivalent saying. Um, another is uh, um, the minimum eigenvalue of the Hessian matrix is greater than or equal to zero. So those are two equivalent descriptions because we'll, uh, this one we'll see uh, next time, may maybe next week. So how this minimum eigenvalue plays in the choice of the step size, um, we try to answer. That's why we have to answer question number two first, and then we get back to question number one. So next time we'll learn uh, how do we choose the step size. So next time, uh, we'll answer this question, how do we choose the step size in the gradient descent? Okay. So that's it for today and uh, um, see you guys on Wednesday.